Hi all, it's good, good to be here again. Congratulations to Zach and Regina and David for keeping this institute going. As I know from experience, the most important thing about institutes is to keep on going, prevail. And when Jared is asked, how are you going? He says, we're still here. And here we are. Uh, Nicole, terrific. You, that paper will be very important to establish who founded the Liberal Party. So let's go back to 1947. I wasn't born, I can say that much. It, it was a pleasant late winter Saturday afternoon in Melbourne. Not different from today, although it was August. Date, 16th of August, 1947. Record snowfalls across the Victorian Alps meant a crisp chill for a dry but cloudy day in Melbourne. Robert Menzies, Australia's Federal Liberal Party opposition leader, <clears throat> was attending a friend's lawn tennis party and heard over the radio the very brief words of Australian Prime Minister Ben Chifley announcing his government would nationalise Australia's trading max. The announcement was as brief as it was sudden. Menzies' first reaction was to think the move would not be unpopular. He recalled the anger felt towards banks for their refusal of credit during the Depression, then of not so distant memory. Ben Chifley likewise remembered this, but with a long-standing resentment at the banks, seeing them as a major reason for the failure of the Scullin government, 1929 to 31. Chifley was confident in his move that Saturday, as the manner of his announcement seemed to indicate. His erstwhile legal expert, Labor, Labor's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Bert Evert, also Attorney General, had assured him the legislation would survive any challenges. The announcement was made in just one sentence to the press, a mere 42 words after a hastily convened cabinet meeting in Canberra on a Saturday. Alas for the Labor Prime Minister, it would prove to be a sadly misjudged step. In time, it would become his nemesis. Chifley had handed his rival Robert Menzies a platform to campaign on all the way to the December 1949 election. And that would be a landslide for the Liberal and Country parties in coalition. A showdown between Labor and Capital had been coming for three decades. He, how this would play out in Australia during the late 1940s and 1950s was not to be imagined. Nationalisation of Australia's banks and the notion that private banking lay at the heart of capitalism had existed from the earliest Labor days of the 1890s. After the debacle of the Scullin government and its failure to manage the credit and financial crisis, not least from its own schism, in 1932, the ALP State Executive in New South Wales produced a report that exonerated Labor's government, Labor's Scullin government, and claimed that the solution in the future was the nationalisation of all Australian banking business. Chifley himself, as a member of the Lions United Australia Party Government's 1930-1937 Royal Commission into Monetary and Banking Systems, had submitted a minority report, this is from Chifley, and advocated the nationalisation of all private banking. So Chifley was keen on nationalisation from an early time. Now, the war years had seen Australia's private banks having to operate, as many of you will know, under the national security regulations. Much of their investments were forcibly secured with the Commonwealth Bank, which was then regarded as Australia's central bank. We didn't have a reserve bank. At the cessation of hostilities in Europe in May 1945, the banks had looked forward to an easing of the war regulations, only to discover that the Labor government intended the regulations to continue. Disruption of business from industrial action had increased, and this added to inflation. The economic times were challenging, and the Chifley government saw the solution in, in, in government having greater control of the financial sector. Under the Banking Act of 45, 1945, local authorities and state governments were banned from dealing with private banks. And this meant the private banks now found themselves on a battle footing, competing with the Commonwealth Bank as if with one hand tied. With this threat to the independence of Australia's trading banks, it was only Leslie J. McConnon, Chief Executive of the National Bank of Australasia, who attempted any pushback by trying to unite the banks in protest. If Geoffrey Blaney had come today, he could tell you all about it. He wrote an excellent book on it. The other banks, too worried about government reprisals, hung back. But McConnell's moment would come after August 1947. He was the man historian Geoffrey Blaney has described as, quote, being interested least in banking and most in public affairs. 
Now, in such an atmosphere, Menzies did not successfully capitalise on the banking issue during the 1946 election campaign, which, as those of you who read about this will realise, was a great disappointment to the Liberal Party. Subsequently, in May 1947, feeling comfortable with his success at the election, his first as Labor leader, Chifley attempted to widen the orders of the 45 Act to apply to additional authorities such as local councils. This led to a challenge in the High Court to the legislation by the wealthy Melbourne City Council, all starts in Melbourne, and who wanted the right to choose its own bank. On Wednesday the 13th of August 1947, the High Court found against the Federal Government a move which angered Chifley. Menzies has written that it was the only time he ever noted Chifley to have lost his temper. The Government now faced the prospect of the private banks challenging the entire Act. It was just three days later that Chifley would announce his Government's decision to nationalise Australia's banking system. Reaction was immediate. We think we're in disruptive times. You should read the newspapers for this. The following Monday, newspapers were leading with front page headlines announcing the move as creating national shockwaves. The Argus in Melbourne threw the switch to extreme with a, sub, with, with, with a heading, totalitarianism, says bank spokesman, spokesman. And the subheading was, Menzies declares to Russia for a parallel. The Sydney Morning Herald headline, Bank Decision Staggers Community, reporting, quote, leading industrialists and others said yesterday that the, that, that the proposed banking monopoly would endanger the nation's economy and threaten private enterprise and individual liberty. And this was just the beginning of a national outcry about the negative implications of the move against Australia's banks. Now, from the point of view of seven decades later, it is hard to conceive that Chifley and Labor might have thought such a move could be sustained in a market economy like Australia. It smacked of unguarded socialism at the very least. And so Menzies bolted from the blocks on day one. In spite of growing disruptions to industry by radical union actions, many influenced by the Communist Party of Australia, it would not be until faced with legislation to nationalise Australia's trading banks that voters were able to connect warnings of communist-inspired activity to their actual lives. Jobs had been easy to find in the post-war economy. Peacetime after war had its own rewards. As Prime Minister Ben Chifley had successfully, as Prime Minister Ben Chifley had successfully handled the ongoing repayment of massive, massive war debts, in particular by getting Labor to eventually accept Australia's ratification of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which installed the International Monetary Fund, still going today. Ongoing industry disruptions had not, up till 1947, had a real impact on daily life. But then came the banking protest over nationalisation and, like a referendum campaign, we're about to have another one, ordinary citizens suddenly were awash with information overdrive as to how socialisation and government control of the market would impact on a free economy. <clears throat> Communism is a growing menace in post-war Europe as well and in domestic union disruption had resonance in the nationalisation of the banks. Commentary and accusations filled daily newspapers. There were accusations of government secrecy, plotting to ambush the banks, and that the government had become dictatorial, suggestions that nationalisation would soon be extended to the insurance industry, notions that UK banks trading in Australia would close, reports that the government would compulsorily acquire shares in banks at a low price, and predictions that there would be large job losses as the trading banks closed. Not only were banking employees on the march, bank customers and other ordinary Australians joined them. Menzies now spoke directly to the middle class voters he had invoked in his radio talks in 1942 to 43, and they were massed and angry. Before the end of 90, August 1947, Menzies was addressing vast rallies of protesting bank employees and other interested individuals, such as workers employed in the insurance industry. Photos in newspapers, those days were the days when all the news came from the newspapers and radio. They showed members spilling out from the function centres onto the streets in their thousands, wide expanses of heads, hats, men and women. The work behind the scenes of Leslie McConnell and his NDA was nothing short of a well-oiled cooking machine. 
A good account of it can be found in Geoffrey Burney's Golden Paper. And for a full account of the anti-nationalisation campaign itself, dig out a copy of A.L. May's The Battles for the Banks. The Sydney Morning Herald reported on its front page on Thursday the 25th of September that members of parliament had received some 500,000 signatures on petitions opposing bank nationalisation. By the end of the year, the print industry, in a country of around 8 million, was celebrating rising income from millions of booklets of pamphlets against nationalisation, largely funded by the banks, especially the UK. Now, Chifley was not for turning. On Tuesday the 17th of September, caucus having approved bank nationalisation the day before, Australians woke to read of the realities of the move. Chifley had announced that the private banks would be, quote, taken over by the Commonwealth Bank, either by agreement or by compulsory acquisition. The terms would be, quote, just, and compensation for property compulsory acquired would be, quote, by agreement or failing agreement by a federal court of claims. Can you imagine it happening today? He added that the changeover might take years. In the Parliament, the Prime Minister spoke confidently, even smugly, that there was nothing in the Constitution to prevent the government taking over banking, if it was thought appropriate, and thus there would be no referendum. The class war in Australia was on as never before. In the House of Representatives on the 18th of September, Menzies moved a censure motion where he accused Giffley of seeking to avoid the will of electors by refusing a referendum and not having proposed bank nationalisation in the 1946 election, but Menzies hadn't taken it up there. Menzies further agreed that Chifley was resorting to dictatorial government that undermined the financial lives of ordinary Australians, or as he put it, the vested interest of one and a half million people who do business with the trading banks. Of that number, at least 1,400,000 are, in the very nature of things, people of modest means. Have they no, quote, vested interest? Have they no right in this life to control their own finances or to go from one bank to another for needed accommodation? A politically controlled government, banking and monopoly, the only one to be created in any English-speaking country or any democratic country in the world will be an instrument of despotism and oppression. After a day or so, the government gagged about the situation, the status quo prevailed, Chifley was secure in knowing two years must pass before another election, and he had a comfortable majority. Meanwhile, in spite of his energised and resolute campaign, Menzies was cautious when a sudden, unexpected Victorian state election was announced and the Liberal opposition fought it on the banking issue. But the Victorian election held on Saturday the 8th of November 1947, in which Menzies campaigned heavily on the banking issue, saw the defeat of John Cain's Labor government and the Liberal Country Party opposition come back into government. At that moment, it would have flickered in Menzies' mind that there was now hope that those who said you'll never vote with Menzies were mistaken. As the Chifley Banking Bill made its way through Parliament in late October and early November 1947, out on the husting as Menzies' first supporter had set supporters had sensed a return of the mood of 1931. In 1931, I had a big argument with, I think it was... Uh, I can't remember who it was over this in the Australian, but 1931, I think, apart from 1943, was the largest landslide in Australia. And this was when groupings around the newly formed United Australia Party, led by Joe Lyons, of which Menzies was a key figure, was stormed into office. Campaigning during the Victorian state election in 1947 at a large rally in Albert Park, Menzies, in top form, referred to those old style rallies or what reporters refer to as just like old times. Speaking in the House of Representatives and leading the debate on the banking bill in the evening of 23rd of October, Menzies watched, was watched by record-filled galleries after hundreds had been turned away. It was an eloquent flourish by the opposition leader because there was no chance the bill fell to pass with the size of Labor's majorities in both houses. But Menzies was making a heady start on an election campaign still two years away. And he objected to the legislation, saying the bill will create in the hands of the ruling party a financial monopoly with unchecked power to grant with, withhold banking facilities or bank accommodation in the case of every citizen. It will have an operation and effect far beyond the business of money changing. It will be a bill, a tremendous step towards the servile state. This is the antithesis of democracy. So there's this constant feeling, this constant theme 
of the communist nationalisation going through the, the message Menzies was sending out. In return for what Menzies said, Arthur Coyle attacked him uh, for opposing legislation and in shrill condemnation said, imagine plunging, plunging Australia into a civil war over a lousy few pence. No matter how many millions the banks spend in this campaign, they cannot withstand the tide of progress. They are finished. Colwell was speaking in old-style Labor dreaming, and sadly for Labor, who could not foresee its folly, this decades-long ideological prejudice, strongly supported by the Communist Party of Australia, was about to meet its match in Australia's highest courts at the time. Chiefly's banking legislation made it through the Senate at the end of November, and within 24 hours was challenged in the High Court by the states of Victoria and South Australia. The High Court challenge became the longest in its history, lasting from the 8th of February, 48, to the 15th of April, a uh, total of 39 days. Uh, the discussion about who was the better lawyer, Bert Evert, looking at Bert Evert during this uh, banking challenges, you'll get your answer. It wasn't as good as he thought. Bert Evert appearing for the government spoke for 18 days. He did not help his case with an aggressive manner and called for the disqualification of two of the judges, which was overruled by Chief Justice Latham. A majority against the government in a key finding of the court, Latham and McTiernan dissenting, was handed down on the 11th of August. It found that the prohibition of business by private banks breached the freedom of interstate trade and commerce protected by Section 92 of the Constitution. An appeal to the Privy Council followed. Beginning in mid-March 49, Bert Evert appearing again for the government, the UK's Privy Council hearing lasted 37 days, during which Evert spoke for 22 days. Two judges died before it finished. Maybe he had some part in that. For all that, the government's appeal was once again lost, the Privy Council handing down its decision on the 26th of July. Chifley's banking legislation lay in tatters. The federal election was just months away. Now, for all that, Menzies now worried that the opposition would not be able to sustain the banking campaign because Labor had finally had its legislation rejected. He also had doubts that the banks would be able to deliver. It was clear that if the banking issue could be kept alive, the coalition would defeat Labor. The banks continued to argue, however, that they were not safe while Chifley and Labor that stayed in opposition. Crucially for Menzies, the NBA's McConnell made a deal. If the opposition could keep up the momentum of positive hope for change, the bank officer's campaign would be re-energised to defeat Chifley on the banking issue. And it was. As historian David Day has written, and we've had our differences, of the 1949 federal election result, in view of the anti-bank nationalisation campaign waged by Menzies and the opposition, says Day, the adverse vote was a rejection of further socialisation and a poll on Chifley's plan for bank nationalisation. During the Menzies era to follow, reform of the Australian banking system continued. Labor's rejection of sections of the coalition's legislation to reform the Invalid Banking Act of 47 was used to call a double dissolution election in 1951. The result delivered a healthy majority in both houses for Menzies, after which the 47 Banking Act was repealed. In 53, the Commonwealth Trading Bank was established and a further Banking Act limited some of the controls that had been imposed on the trading banks. In 1957, the Menzies government began legislation to set up the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Commonwealth Banking Corporation. The legislation was finally passed in January 1960. Further arrangements in the early 1960s saw the trading banks and the Reserve Bank develop special term loan funds providing, provided by the trading banks to meet Australia's growing development. In 1964, the Australian Bankers Export Refinance Corporation came into being and in this way, the Menzies years quietly changed Australia's banking system for all time. But in conclusion, I'll let Robert Menzies have the final word. Writing of Ben Chifley and the bank nationalisation saga decades after, in afternoon light, Menzies concluded with respect to Chifley as follows. By upholding the principles of his party, he paradoxically helped destroy his party. If one's ideas are so rigid that they will not bend, the chances are that they will break. Socialisation led Chifley to defeat.
Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was absolutely fascinating and impeccably timed, which is what I like. <laughs> uh, we now have 10 minutes of Q&A uh, for Anne. So I think Will once again has the microphone. And over. Thank you. Uh, Charles Richardson. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, the impression I get, and, and I'm hoping you'll correct me if I'm wrong. The, the impression I get from what you say is that from Labor's point of view, there's something very special about banking. Like it's, it's not a general impulse towards nationalization here, there and everywhere, but, but rather something about the central role of the finance system that, that impels them towards nationalization. And that therefore, it, while it may, it, it may also not be any uh, sign of a general impulse that, you know, had Chifley been re-elected, other industries would have been nationalised as well. Um, what, what, what do you think about that? Well, it doesn't quite follow. Um, if you go right back, I mean, even Joe Lyons was out there on the hustings as a Labor member for Tasmania, banging on about capitalism and Labor. It was the old, nowadays what you'd say, anti-communism and pro-communism debate. And Labor instinctively believed that all corruption lay in capitalism and by that in the banking system. They saw it in a sort of that old-fashioned notion of being anti-usury, I mean, that we were all being taken to the cleaners by greedy men who lent us money and then squeezed us to get a profit. And at the time, I don't know what Chifley might have done, but if he'd won through on the Banking Act, he certainly was prepared to go right into insurance and everywhere. The, the party was all for it. And um, the reason that Menzies and McConnell, the, the um, National Bank of Australia, whatever, um, were successful was because it resonated with ordinary people. Even Jack Daniel Mannix was upset because he couldn't move to whatever bank he wanted to. I mean, people, people had lives to lead, loans to get, business to, to operate. They didn't want to be told that they had to go cap in hand to the the central bank of the government, it was just like a communist, it was a command economy moment. And what's interesting about Australia was, in spite of the fact that a lot of people were all in favour of government helping them and government, they, even all the disruption in the unions hadn't really broken through to average people. They were quite happy, like today, especially in Victoria, thinking that the government was the, you know, the font of all money. But when it came to interfering with their choice of banks, it really resonated. So I'm not really sure about that. I think it was certainly a, a pivotal moment for Labor and they've never gone back to it. They never will. Um, and I just wonder whether today some of the policies, if they're taken too stridently forward uh, on green energy or whatever, might have the same effect that we're yet to see. Yes, we've got a live experiment here. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah again, <laughs> Melbourne's at the forefront. <laughs> or Victoria. Uh, Steve. Ste Great, thanks very much, Anne. That's, I'm Stephen Wilkes from the ANU in Canberra, so hello. Um, look, I've got a question about the personal relationship between Menzies and Chifley. I mean, famously at the 1951 ball at the old Parliament House when Menzies announced Chifley's death, he was in tears. Did he attempt to engage directly at the personal level with Chifley on the nationalisation issue or any other significant issue of the time, for that matter, or was it so such an intense issue, such an uh, deep ideological matter? Did he only conduct uh, the, uh, his discourse at the public and political level? Well, politicians were um, under unguided rules or unwritten rules of gentlemanness in those days, or they could be pretty tough in Parliament. But if you go back and look at Menzies' recollection of people in his memoirs and other books, he's kind about Chifley, but he does believe in this case. He, he didn't do any personal thing. They, they were very much in their own camps. There was he did debate in Parliament and he had a go at various members of the Labor Party. I think underneath it all, he kind of um, respected Chifley, partly because he thought Chifley handed Evett very well. Um, Evett was the one that I think Menzies completely had little time for, although he was careful about it. And he saw Chif, as they called him, as being the old trade unionist who, confronted by this 
ultra clever lawyer who thought he was the cleverest lawyer in the, in the world uh, could shuffle him off. And I think that's why if he spent so much time overseas, Chief was quite happy for him to keep running around the world because he was never there. He used to be joked about that Everett was sort of away somewhere um, in order to get him out of the way to some extent. So there wasn't anything personal, but in his memoirs, um, Menzies does suggest that Chifley was piqued with his own pride and um, was rather um, too confident of what he could do and that it was a moment of his own personal misguidance because of his own feeling that he could do anything he wanted. And, of course, he wasn't helped by Everett giving him the feeling that with all Everett's brains, it wouldn't fail in the courts. Um, yes. I understand that the big four banks are controlled primarily by overseas capital. Uh, so in what way might that be better than having uh, a nationalized banking sector, such as uh, Commonwealth Bank used to be at one time? I think it all goes back to competition, what there is of it. I mean, you can't talk about the monetary system anymore in the way you did in 1947 anyway. I mean, if you look at the way in which money is swilling around the world, um, Victoria now has a debt greater than Queensland, New South Wales and Tasmania, and they just seem to keep on piling it on. Uh, to my mind, I don't know how it works, but it's almost like debt's a new currency. Um, I remember going to the States back in the early days of George W. Bush administration and everyone was panicking about the fact that pension funds would run out of money, that they were up to their eyebrows in debt. Well, they just kept on piling on the debt and the debt's gone up and gone up and gone up. Um, uh, the role of lending money, banks, all of that, I think has gone way beyond what we're talking about in 1947 and I can't imagine anything like um, the proposals of 1947 happening and um, the idea that it can all be controlled from one, one source of so-called good government is farcical. Um, but I think competition and the ability to have the freedom to fight your patch or whatever you do, I think that's the key to as much as we can, keeping it as much as we can honest. Briefly, I'm wondering, Ashley Wag, I'm wondering what part of that was political opportunism after the Neymar inquiry, which I think was in 30-31, wasn't it? When, and there was a banking, uh, it was about Australia's debt, and they sent... Um, there was a Premier's meeting in 31, and the British... Yep. came out to advise yep. earlier than that, yeah. Yeah, that was right. That well, was that's right. when it was determined that... Um, and this is one of the reasons why Lyons left the party, because yep. um, Labor had was terribly divided, and I can't remember the historian, Chris, or one of them, said that it, through the padded doors of Parliament, caucus could be heard outside. It was so screamingly bad. But with... Um, Scullin went off for five months to, the, to Britain for various reasons, and um, Lyons and Fenton, it was hopeless for divisions, but Lyons was against the sort of um, monetary policy that the left of the Labour Party were pushing, printing money, whatever. But at that Premier's Conference in 31, with the agreement of the states, a lot of what Lyons was pushing for was agreed to, and that is cut back on spending and, and various restrictions, much of which a lot of Labor people were very angry about. And some people say that he said, oh, I could have stayed at the party. You know, it's happened. But um, it didn't do any good for Labor because at the end of 31, they were just wiped out. And, and, and the real problem for Labor at that time was they just couldn't cope with financial re regulation or financial policy or monetary policy. They were just at sea. They, they were too back in system. The other thing about Menzies was you've got to remember that Menzies was very important to the formation of the UAP. He was fundamental along with six businessmen, which included Keith Murdoch. So when he forms the Liberal Party, he's already had this experience of bringing people together and doing it. And it all came off the back of mostly um, very well healed financial people in Melbourne, whom he had very good relationships with, they knew more about how to handle a fragile problem with the economies. So um, I'm, I don't think the Premier's Congress helped Labor. Uh, final question from Paul. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, and moving on a long way from 1954, um, I'm interested in your comments on some of the political dynamic um, that was around the establishment that John Howard put in place of the Campbell Committee that took the Australian financial system one step further into the international world and um, the extent to which um, Labor was, as far as I can recall, relatively silent on it, but there was tension within the um, conservative ranks. Uh, it wasn't exactly Malcolm F Fraser's uh, favourite step that Howard was taking um, to lead us into a more international financial system. Would you care to comment on the two well, parts? Well, I'm the last person to ask about financial policy, <laughs> but I do recall it was the Labor Party that what did we, 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 we floated the dollar and all that kind of thing. But it was important, the Campbell, the Campbell Inquiry, Campbell Report, whatever, what was it? I mean, it, look, we took our tentative steps then and where it's gone too far forward, I have no idea. You'd have to ask some financial advisors about that. But certainly the Howard years were an important forward march in that. that I mean, I'm fascinated at the moment, totally different from your question, that the Reserve Bank is now being accused of breaking its promises. In my era, Reserve Banks didn't make promises. They never said whether the dollar would go up or down or interest rates would go up or down. The idea that the governor of the Reserve Bank is breaking his promises, that's astounding. And it means I am i think that people have forgotten what their role is. And having they, everybody thinks they're an influencer. Everybody thinks they can take charge. Whether you're a person who got abused at school or whether you're a celebrity in Los Angeles or whether you're the head of the Reserve Bank, I mean, they're all out there kind of giving us information, giving us their advocacy and whatever. I think that's the problem at the moment. We may have let some of these people get too much time at the microphone. Maybe I should go too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne Henderson.